Hi, I'm Linda Silverman, Director of Gifted Development Center and the Institute for the Study of Advanced Development in Westminster, Colorado. And I'm here today with Joy Lawson Davis, and she will introduce herself in just a minute. We're going to be talking to you about eliminating gifted programs and how that increases inequity. And we were uh, aware of what was going to be a national crisis in gifted education last year when we began talking about this presentation. And what has just happened in the last week in New York City is very frightening. I think it's catastrophic for gifted education and that once more, we are being scapegoated and called racist and as if just getting rid of the gifted program in New York City or any other city is going to get rid of racism. And I think we have to be aware of what scapegoating is. Scapegoating is when you don't want to face a problem and you find somebody to blame that you don't care about. The scapegoat takes the blame. We have a moral issue of racism in our country. We have an economic issue of haves and have nots in our country. And giftedness is not a disease. It's not something that can be fixed or ignored. And it just getting rid of gifted programs does not erase the haves and have not discrepancy or the racism in the country. And I think that we are misguided. And that's why Joy and I have decided to share this with you. Joy? Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Linda. Uh, yeah, Linda and I have been uh, in conversation, as she said, for well over a year about this issue. Uh, again, my name is Joy Lawson Davis. I am an independent consultant, uh, but I've also been fortunate enough in the last year to become an adjunct instructor at both Johns Hopkins University and the Bridges Academy of, of Cognitive Diversity in California. I um, have been working on this issue of inequities and in gifted education all of my career, which has been well over four decades. And I am appalled, like Linda, like many of my other colleagues, I am appalled by this, this uh, movement that appears to be happening in the United States that's going to uh, do what some think is, uh, is to eliminate um, gifted programs, but what it's going to do is going to increase inequity. The children who can least afford to have um, access to gifted services or advanced learning programs removed from their schools are going to be those who are going to be hurt the most. Black students, Latinx students, low income students, twice exceptional students, all of those students are among a group that we know of as underrepresented populations. When we look at the gifted education data nationally, statewide, locally, we know that these students are those who are the least likely to be identified as gifted, to be recognized even as having gifted traits like other students do from the majority culture. We also know that those students are the ones whose parents are least likely to be able to afford access to outside programming and test preparation and all the other uh, discrepancies that we know of in our culture. And so to, to just eliminate gifted programming is not the way to go to, to, to in, increase equity in gifted programming. What we know, and we know this well because we've seen school districts do this, when they change their admissions procedures, when they change their uh, tests that they utilize, when they change uh, teacher training procedures, when they change parent engagement procedures, we see a change in the way that students from these underrepresented populations are are, are identified, receive access, and then flourish in gifted education classrooms and programs. These kids come to school bright. These kids come to school ready. They, they come to school uh, differently than other students do. And because they do, they have a right. 
they have a right and their families have a right to access high level instruction from the time they set their foot in the door. And it's not fair to these kids that they are being used as, as Linda says, as a scapegoat because school districts aren't able to come up with procedures that are equitable and fair and non-discriminatory and non-racist to identify them as gifted and, and be able to provide these services early on in their school careers. We're gonna talk about some of these strategies here. We're gonna talk about how this can be done and how we should not be using these kids and their families to, to address a major issue that we cannot address just by removing programs of gift for gifted services from our schools. Linda. Thank you, Joy. So the question that is being raised on a national level that we all in the field are going to have to address is do gifted programs worsen equality? Do they really hurt children of color? And we're going to have to have answers to those questions to give to our school districts, to give to the media, and to give to the legislators to protect gifted education nationwide. This is the claim that NBC News had in a report last year. And gifted education has been under attack before. We've been called segregated, we've been called racist, and I think that gifted education is in serious danger of being abolished in many cities. But are the claims true? Or are gifted programs simply the scapegoats of a racially biased society? That's what we're going to be talking about. So these are some ideas that Joy and I have come up with about why we feel that eliminating gifted programs is not the answer. Gifted programs, we believe, will not address inequities in our schools. Underrepresented gifted students have many identities. They do need support for their giftedness as much as they do for their cultural differences. Students who can least afford uh, enrichment, access to enrichment, acceleration, and services to meet their asynchronous development and their advanced cognitive capacities will be hurt the most if programs are destroyed. Why will they be hurt? They will be hurt because they will not be engaged in classroom instruction that meet these needs that they have, that meet these needs. And over time, in just a short time, actually, two to three years, these students will begin to, to languish in the classroom. They will begin to uh, act out in classrooms. And then, of course, they'll be seen as anything but gifted. And they will then be uh, attacked, these children will. They will be looked at as, uh, as behavior problems. They will be looked at as students who cannot learn. And, and we know what happens in schools when these students are looked at in a negative or a deficient way. This is why we have to start programming for gifted services early on and not look at gifted program services as inequitable. If we design them differently, we can do a better job with meeting the needs of these students. Joy, I want to piggyback on what you just said, because I do believe that if we sacrifice gifted education, these children who are looked at as problems because they have leadership ability are going to get into more trouble because they're going to use their giftedness in some way. And if they don't use it in a positive way, if it's not channeled, then they will use it in a negative way. And I believe we're, this, is, this whole uh, zeitgeist is going to lead to uh, a tremendous amount of not just misinformation and not finding the kids, but the kids getting into trouble. So I believe that sacrificing the gifted in misguided attempts to reduce race, racism prevents the most brilliant members of culturally diverse groups from being discovered and nurtured. And we know that there are brilliant Latino kids. We know that there are brilliant Black kids. We know that there are brilliant 
Native American kids. And they are going to need public school protection, advancement, development, because they don't have the resources. Most of them don't have the resources to be able to access these outside of school. Black, Latino, and low-income students who become leaders are often nurtured by selective schools that welcome diverse students. And if we abolish gifted programs, if we follow in the lead of New York City, we will widen the gap between the haves and the have-nots. Because as Joy says, affluent people will always find a way to get their children's needs met. Poor kids rely on public schools. If we take that away from them, we are denying them the right to be gifted and to develop their gifts. I believe that gift, eliminating gifted programs is the very highest form of discrimination. It suggests that being underrepresented or being a black student or being a Latinx student or poor student and you, means that you can't be gifted. It's, it, it says that you can't be gifted. It, I, think, I think it is a very shrewd but rapidly spreading bias. Affluent families will always find a way to get their children what they need. P poor families, African-American families because of systemic racism that exists throughout, throughout our society won't have access, won't be able to engage their students in after school programming, summertime programming that, that costs uh, great, a, a lot of money that many times they can't access often because they don't get information from our schools about what those programs are. They're not supported in the same way. And as Linda said, these students need public schools and it's their right to, public school, to a public school education that meets their cognitive, intellectual, and their affective needs. It is not fair for them to have to flourish, to, for him to not have an opportunity to flourish in a school environment that meets their needs. They will flounder. They will flounder in these other settings. They will not be seen. Teachers will be so busy meeting the needs of students who come to school with less deficient skills. Um, teachers will, will not be able to have the time because of everything else that's going on in the classroom and during this pandemic and what's gonna happen beyond the pandemic. Teachers will not, even with, even with the best training, teachers will not have the opportunity to see these students for who they are, for who they are, and bring to them instruction that meets their needs in an, in a, in an advanced way and in a culturally responsive way. We have to be very careful about how we change models in, of instruction without have, being sure that teachers have the right kind of training to match with the students that they're serving. At the age of four, Michelle read fluently. She skipped second grade. By sixth grade, she stood out among her peers and began attending gifted classes. She learned French and she took accelerated courses. Michelle attended Chicago's first magnet high school for gifted students. She graduated cum laude from Princeton and went on to, er to earn a law degree at Harvard Law School. She came from one of the most impoverished areas of Chicago. That Michelle is Michelle Obama. And I encourage you to read her book, Becoming. It's an eye opener. If we abandon gifted programs as we are being entreated to do once again, we ignore the benefits of gifted programs for diverse students like Michelle Obama. She wrote in this book, I wasn't afraid to raise my hand in class. At Whitney Young, it was safe to be smart. You never hid your intelligence for fear of someone saying you talked like a white girl. This is prejudice against giftedness as well as prejudice against being black. So you take away any support for giftedness and you, go, you see kids going into hiding kids who have the capacity to get PhDs that don't raise their hand.
We worsen inequality because children of privilege have access to a wealth of resources, whereas children of limited means are dependent on public schools to identify and develop their special abilities. Joy, this is from your newest book. Yes, you know, and in my newest book with my colleague uh, Deb Douglas and a number of of other specialists, uh, experts actually in the field of gifted education around these underrepresented populations, we we suggest that underrepresented gifted students are at a grave disadvantage in our schools once again because they are typically not identified early, they do not have a voice in creating programs to meet their varied needs. They don't have equitable access, once again, to gifted education and advanced learning programs compared to the majority culture. That's simply not fair. And when we, again, speak of these programs, I'm talking here about public school programs, the educators in those programs without, without specialized training are unfamiliar with the concerns and issues of these students, families, and communities. There are a number of us, once again, who are working to train educators across the country to become more culturally competent, more culturally competent, not only to work with these students differently, but also to work with their families. They have to understand better how society views them, what their ethnic and cultural differences and norms and traditions are, what, the, what students' gender concerns are, their language differences, and other social constructs with which they identify and shape their identities. These are the kinds of training models that we are suggesting through our publications and also in our, in our training sessions that we conduct across the country through gifted education now. The mission of education is to foster development of all students regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, gender identification, economic status, geographic location, linguistic background, or gender identity. That is what we claim that we're doing in education. We have to understand that giftedness occurs in all socioeconomic and in all ethnic groups. And it's imperative that the increasingly diverse student body gain equal access to programs for gifted students. No one would intentionally stunt the growth of a child. Yet this is what educational systems do when they are blind to individual differences in ability in diverse populations. I have a picture here of a tall poppy and I'm wearing, I don't know whether you can see this, but I'm wearing a poppy today because the poppy in, in down under symbolizes giftedness. The tall poppy gets cut down. Gifted people, eminent people, anyone who stands tall above the rest get cut down because this is a worldwide syndrome to cut down people who may want to be more advanced who may achieve more than you achieve. So there is a risk in being a gifted person. And the risk is not just that you won't develop your potential. That's a, a little risk. In the history, the history of the world, the gifted have been killed because they are the ones who will stand up to injustice. They are the ones that you have to watch out for if you're a totalitarian government that has taken over a new area. They'll stand up to you. The gifted are our moral leaders and we are doing a severe injustice to them by saying, no, 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 just go back to the regular classroom. That's gonna help everybody. We all need to be cognizant of our students' affective needs as well as their intellectual and academic needs. And again, in our training, in our classrooms where we actually are providing this kind of information for classroom teachers, uh, throughout um, professional development, throughout coursework, 
teachers learn more about gifted students and their affective as well as their intellectual needs. We know from research and from observation of gifted students across cultural groups that they're more sensitive, they're more intense, they're more empathetic than others. Therefore, we need to provide specialized training for teachers to understand who they are. Simply eliminating programs in our schools will not eliminate these characteristics of these students. High ability youngsters are different from the norm. They're different in the way they feel, the way they think, the way they behave. They see the world differently and they maintain these characteristics throughout their lifetime. They process information differently, think differently, and they usually even talk or speak differently than other students. We have an obligation. We have an obligation, a moral obligation. As Linda mentioned earlier, we do have a moral obligation to seek these students out, to seek them out, provide access to enriched instruction, high level instruction for them, engage their families so they'll understand better how to raise them and how to advocate for them. We do have an obligation to these young people. A concept that has become very important to both Joy and me is intersectionality. I'm not sure if this is one you've heard of before. Intersectionality is the recognition that members of minority groups have multiple social identities, which intersect to create a whole that is different from the parts. Underrepresented gifted students have multiple social identities, which intersect to form their individual identities. And Joy will tell you more about this. Well, this phenomenon of intersectionality comes from the work of a legal scholar that many of us are becoming more and more familiar with. Her name is Kimberly Crenshaw. Crenshaw wrote about intersectionality as a young legal scholar when she was discussing the intersect between being a female, being a black female and participating in uh, legal, legal studies and how the law affected black females. And so now we're beginning to see more work uh, emerging where individuals who are in education, social and the social sciences also are beginning to look more deeply at what intersectionality means to us and to the students that we serve. Gifted children are more likely, um, oftentimes, Black gifted children especially, are more likely to be under, uh, to be unfairly treated, because, not only because of their ethnicity, but also because of their giftedness, which raises additional challenges for them. Sometimes the discrimination is overt and intended. Sometimes it's more subtle and maybe unintended. But that unintention also raises issues for us and concerns for us. And so just be, once again, because we eliminate a program model, we'll not remove from our culture these uh, subtle discriminations that Black students in particular have to face every day. Gifted students have multiple and overlapping identities, we call them, that result from a, a number of varied social constructs or, or multiple identities that affect their lives their culture, how society perceives them, their income level, once again, family, gender, their academic strengths. It is important for us as a society understand what all of these intersectional social identities or these multiple social identities are as we engage with, with these students. Society's perceptions of black students has a lot to do with how they conduct themselves and how they feel about themselves, their self-esteem in the classroom, in community, and in family. We know that we continue to be, of all cultural groups, Blacks are, Black continue to be the most oppressed group within our entire society. We have to, we have to address that. We have to deal with that. And again, eliminating gifted programs is not going to help us address the oppressed group status of African-American Black students and Latino and poor students in our schools. Knowing more about the family and community and how that impacts the student as they walk in that school door every day, their other exceptionalities, their gender, their income, the culture in general, 
is really important. If we don't understand these intersectional so social identities and the way these students navigate these different worlds every day, we're missing out on so much, so much about how we should be treating them, working with them and helping them to develop their full potential. Gifted children of color may feel very isolated and the gifted program may be the only place where they feel safe, where they make friends who understand them and where they are urged to develop their talents. And I, I love this concept that you came up with, Joy. We are more than you think we are. We are, we are more, so much more. And having, and having the opportunity to view the many worlds of our students that, as they navigate them daily, it's critical to developing positive, affirming, and empowering relationships with them. And if you don't understand the, the full scope of who our students are and what they have the capacity to become, then once again, we're shortchanging them. We're shortchanging them. We're not meeting our moral obligation to them. As you know, this um, is a clip from the film Hidden Figures, and it talks about the Black females who were behind the space program or in, in, in during that time and in, in this particular book and in film, it's, it, they were called human computers. And who would have known about all of this had, not, had someone not gone back and done the research to discuss how these young ladies, even during a very discriminatory time, discriminatory by discrimination by race and by gender that they were facing, they were actually able to go into the, into the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and become a very significant part of the work that was being done there because they were gifted in the areas of mathematics and science. We are more, so much more than, than sometimes general society sees of us. Again, eliminating programs for young people like this is not the way to go. It is absolutely not the way to go. So Joy, these are some of the misguided myths that I'd like you to share your perceptions on. So yeah, I think we've shared some of these already, but it's important for us to recognize that if we abolish, you know, this, this first myth here uh, says is big, it says a lot. Abolishing gifted programs will help children of color. Well, we, we absolutely uh, do not agree. We've seen that, that gifted programs uh, have a great benefit. Well, I've, I've been working with families across this country, uh, Black families in particular, Latino families in particular, conducting workshops all over the country. And I know that these families recognize and appreciate the value of their gifted children having access to gifted programs. So cutting out these programs and, and just absolutely not having access in many different school districts across the nation will hurt and not help these children. But we, uh, they also, we also accept the fact that um, admissions is one of the issues with, uh, with our programs, but changing admissions procedures to gifted programs um, and suggesting that that means that the programs will be watered down, that's a myth, that is a myth. And again, that's the myth that's being perpetuated by people who want to, um, who want to change what we do in gifted education, but don't believe that we can change it and have it to be more equitable and more accessible. That's, that is not the case. Admissions procedures can be adjusted, can be adapted to match with the needs of a broader population of gifted students. I've seen that happen. We're beginning to see it happen more and more. Um, I just finished uh, teaching a course and one of my students uh, described in her school district a process that they've gone through and they've been very, very successful with changing the way they identify gifted students and opening up access to a wider uh, group of students by ethnicity. They have a successful model, it's working. I believe these models can work across the country. There's another myth that gifted children come from advantaged families. <laughs> giftedness has nothing to do with affluence or affluence has nothing to do with giftedness. It has nothing to do with how much money parents have. What parents have been able to do, affluent parents have been able to do, again, in a very you know, in a very discriminatory way, have been able to access test preparation 
because they have funds, but that doesn't mean that their kids are any more gifted than students whose families can't access test preparation. So we have to work hard to, to call out these myths, these myths in gifted education and work to abolish them. Well, one of the reasons why that myth exists is that in affluent areas, they do seem to find more gifted kids than they do in poor areas. And so that's how people have come to the misunderstanding that there are more rich gifted kids than there are poor gifted kids, but that is not the truth. If you were to take all the gifted people on the face of the earth and just line them up, the vast majority would be poor because the poor vastly outnumber the rich. And if we understand that, we will look more carefully at children who don't have the means because hidden within that group of children are some brilliant kids whose needs must be met and will not be met without talent scouts, without people going into their communities and looking for them. Early identification of children, gifted children in, in poverty and supporting their abilities absolutely changes their lives. Joy, here are a couple more. Um, yeah, a few more myths. You know, we have a number of them. And I, and I would say that in our training, we always uh, call these myths out to ensure that uh, school personnel are aware. And if these are some of the myths that they have been carrying and having conversations about, we provide evidence that that is not the case. That get, this is another one, uh, gifted children will succeed without specialized programming. We've been hearing that for years, the gifted children will be okay. They're gifted. Why do, we, why do they need what we have to offer in schools? Well, they are gifted, but they also need to have opportunities to engage with peers like themselves, who students like themselves who think like they do, who have the same uh, concerns and you know who have the same uh, interests as they do. They also need to be able to move uh, forward in their content and understanding. They need to have those opportunities. It's not fair to a child who comes into say third grade and he or she is, um, is reading at the seventh grade level that all year long, they have no opportunities to read advanced, advanced uh, materials, literature and analyze that literature at a higher level. It's not fair to them. They will not be as successful if they don't have access to specialized programming. It's important for them to have access to specialized programming so they can become the fully developed person that they were born to be. It's really one of the, this is one of those uh, myths that really irritates me more than anything, because I've seen far too many students who have had who have not had experiences and how they have floundered and in many cases failed and in many cases had tragic outcomes. And then I've seen others who have had access, who have had access from poor backgrounds, from black backgrounds, who Latin, from Latinx backgrounds, who have had access and how they have become quite successful. And many of them have gone back into their own communities to assist and to help and to, and to help out in their own communities. And then who have also had worldwide success in addressing some of the concerns and problems we have as a, as a human condition. We have a responsibility to these kids. And, it, and we also have a number of colleagues who still say that gifted programs can be successful without integrating culturally responsive teaching, without considering uh, student self-advocacy and parent-family collaboration. That's also a myth. We know that when we have African-American, Latinx, Native American students in the classroom situation, we know that teachers need to understand who those children are, how they, who they are fully, who they are, what is their culture like, what are their norms, what are their values, traditions. We need to be able to bring the classroom, bring the family and the community into the classroom so students are more comfortable and that they feel like the gifted program belongs to them. It is, you know, we again, we have a, a strong body of research uh, and that general education has been using for quite some time. We are beginning to use it, uh, culturally responsive teaching pedagogies in gifted education, and people are getting excited. 
Again, they're getting very excited because now they're understanding what was missing in the classroom, what kind of instruction was missing, what kind of connection, what kind of trust was missing. When these students don't, don't believe they can trust their gifts to teachers who don't understand and don't know them, then we have a problem. We have a problem. They will not share with you who they are. We have, we have an obligation to ensure that these students feel comfortable in the classroom. They have opportunities to self-advocate and they also and that we also bring their families and the communities in so that we can have strong relationships to benefit the students and benefit the school in general. I've often said that nothing is gained in the name of democracy by holding back the brightest students. You can't bring up the bottom by pulling down the top. So what we're doing by not allowing equitable access to gifted programs is a civil rights violation. We can fix that, we can address that, we can change that. Abolishing gifted programs is not the answer. Making, it more, making them more equitable is the answer. As the student body grows more diverse, there is increasing necessity to ensure that all students have equal access to gifted programs. Failure to identify and develop the advanced abilities of gifted children who are culturally diverse, economically deprived, or twice exceptional is justifiably viewed as a civil rights violation. I had the opportunity many years ago to go into um, a state on the East Coast where I was asked to address the question of equity for to all of the district coordinators. And so in advance, they sent me all of the plans of every school district in the state. And I read them and every single plan had exactly the same fatal flaw. And I came in and I acted like I was Moses. And I said, I come to you with a word from God. Change and to or in your plans because you're requiring these students to show high ability and high achievement. And it is not fair to the students. And that's why you don't have equitable programs. Districts in search of equity need to recognize that there are multiple pathways for demonstrating giftedness and children should not be required to be gifted in all of them. I believe we have to go into the community if we're going to find children who are gifted but hidden in the, in the school's situation. Some of these children are going to show their giftedness in ways that you will not see in school. They may not raise their hands, but at home, if you talk to their parents, you'll find out that this child acts as a translator for the family because this child's English is the best. Or this is the child who mediates conflict among peers or the child who shows strong persistence in difficult tasks, or the child who's a pathfinder with unusual visual spatial talent, or a child who's the leader at church, or the child who's extraordinarily curious and follows that curiosity. I've talked about wanting to create a child find program to find children of promise in daycare centers, preschools, churches, and community centers. And Joy got very excited about this because she's talked about creating a community talent search. Joy, what would that community talent search look like? Well, you know, Linda, uh, when you mentioned this uh, earlier, I thought, oh my goodness, I've been thinking about this and sharing this kind of idea for a number of years, and uh, particularly in, in, school, in communities where students are being underrepresented. 
And, um, and so what I would like to see is that we engage daycare center um, providers, preschool teachers or preschool administrators, church leadership even, and um, community people who are, who are operating community centers, after school community centers, summertime community centers. I'd like to engage those individuals in helping us to locate students who display certain types of characteristics, leadership characteristics, students who have a lot of conversation about a particular topic that, that seems to be, you know, something that most kids their age don't talk about. Um, and the one who, um, who, is, who is more empathetic, the one who takes the opportunity to help other children. Uh, so, so I do believe that we are missing out on a number of individuals and a an, and an number of opportunities to seek out these students early. They can be three, four, or five years old, or even after school programs for students who are even older than that. Have these individuals help us uh, find these students, uh, you know, be a part of the child find process, the, uh, the talent search process, and, and determine what those students' needs might be, and then make a connection uh, with the school. I think that uh, a number of persons in these communities will be very cooperative. Uh, because they also see something different about the children that they serve, and they really are interested when educators come to them and suggest that there's something else that can happen to help enrich this child's life or provide a different set of services for, for, for the child. Um, again, you know, this is a very holistic, culturally responsive way of going about seeking out giftedness in students from populations that we generally don't um, have the opportunity to find, or we're not making as, as, as uh, many efforts to find. These underrepresented groups are gifted all day, like any other gifted child, they're gifted all day, every day. And we, um, I think we have an obligation to come up with strategies to, uh, to go conduct, like you call it, a community talent search um, for children of promise. I think we can be successful doing that. Joy, I loved your book, Bright, Talented, and Black, and I'm very excited about your newest book that was just released. And what we're going to be sharing now is some of the information in that new book. And I'm asking Joy the question, what do underrepresented gifted children need? So again, we, you know, myself and Deb Douglas have uh, co-edited and just released a, what we believe is a phenomenal tool for classroom teachers, for counselors, for community center leaders uh, to work with and empower underrepresented gifted students. We have gathered together experts uh, from across the country in particular areas of, of giftedness who focus on certain populations. And we have uh, a model within the text and that can, can serve as a guideline. And what we found uh, that we, what we know is that underrepresented children, uh, gifted children need increased opportunities uh, to honestly with educators, with counselors, honestly be able to share their life stories in safe spaces, we call them, with culturally sensitive adults. We, we know that these students need to have opportunities to make choices for selection of courses the, to design their own path. Uh, as they continue through middle school and high school. Um, we know that they also need to have opportunities to serve on advisory councils, school boards. They have a lot to say, and these programs are designed for them. So why not give them the opportunity to be a part of these, um, these decision-making bodies and other policy-making committees? Give them uh, an opportunity for what we call student agency and voice in the creation of their the instructional design to meet their needs and their strengths and encourage students to share their views regarding the challenges and the benefits of gifted services we want to really know what gifted education the benefits of gifted education are or what some of the challenges are talk to the students talk to the students encourage teachers and counselors and others to also share their stories so that students uh, feel comfortable with these individuals that are working with them 
host programming and information I, you know i've always recommended that we take gifted education outside of school into the community where students reside and host information sessions in the community what we're attempting to do is build a sense of belonging inclusion but a, more so a sense of belonging that gifted services belongs to every community and ensure that our gifted uh, training is always provided in, in the first language of every student. It's very important that families and community members, when they come to these sessions, that they uh, are able to engage in their, in their own language. And we can never uh, underestimate the value of mentors Absolutely. from targeted communities. We need to make sure that these students know that there are people who look just like them, who come from their communities, who have had great success, who have had great success uh, in many ways um, with their own lives or challenges. But then they were able to, through persistence and certain types of programming, been able to succeed. So we are we're saying keep the programs don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but increase access to gifted programs for underrepresented students and joy i'd like you to read this last slide. Yes, for sure um, in gifted ed, I think, at this time, because this is a critical time, this is a turning point for us as a as a uh, society but definitely as a field because we the issues have been raised we are looking and we're seeing more people concerned uh, about the needs of students from culturally diverse backgrounds uh, we we see people who are who are speaking up now about discriminatory practices in gifted education i think that we have an opportunity to redress racism by restructuring gifted and advanced learning programs not eliminating but restructuring and opening access to all underrepresented group, groups of gifted students who have the potential to make significant contributions to our human condition doing anything less anything less will have detrimental effects for all of us we hope that you'll take this presentation and you have our permission to take these slides and this video and share it with anyone that you think can make a difference. That would be our fondest wish. Joy is just gonna tell you a little bit more about her new book. So our book was just released. We spoke about it earlier. Uh, Deb, Douglas and I are extremely excited. Uh, we appreciate the work that Free Spirit Publishing has done for us. We have chapters from expert scholars uh, across the field who have written about the needs of Black students, Latinx students, American Indian, Native American, students from poverty, twice exceptional students, ELL students, LGBTQ students, and families of diverse learners. We have, and we we had a we had a group of students actually to also write a chapter about self-advocacy and an effort they made at their own school in in Florida. Uh, and so I think that you don't want to miss this book. You really don't want to miss this book. It provides guidelines for you as educators, as advocates, to work with each of these separate populations to help empower them and to improve access to gifted services and also to improve their life outcomes. We believe that you will be very pleased uh, with this book and we appreciate all of the support we've had so far. Uh, please reach out if you have questions or you, if you would like us to share more about empowering underrepresented gifted students. Thank you. Thank you.